Hi, it's uh, Benjamin Douglas Ray with another edition of uh, Sustainable Cannabis TV. Today I have Caitlin Urso here and she's an environmental consultant with CDPHE here in Colorado. How are you today? Good. I'm happy to be here. Thanks virtually. For <laughs> this show is brought to you by BuzzFeed, LinkedIn for Leaders, and Eight Saints brand, uh, organic CBD products made from Colorado organic hemp. You can find the URLs down at the bottom of the page here. So, Caitlin, how are you today? You got some snow. You're here in Colorado. You're over in Morrison. Is that right? Yep. Yep. Over in Morrison, enjoying watching it snow, um, working from home with, you know, during the pandemic. <laughs> yeah, I know. We got we got about an inch here. You know, I'm a little bit east of you, maybe by about 10 miles, but still still in the front range here. So I really want to thank you for coming on this show. If you could give the viewers and listeners some of your background and tell us what you're up to at CDPHE. Absolutely. So um, I'm a Colorado native. I, I was born here. I went to high school um, not too far from here um, at Bear Creek High School. I got my mechanical engineering degree up in CU Boulder. Um, I did mechanical engineering because I had a real interest in problem solving and math and science. But it, when I graduated with mechanical engineering degree, I didn't really align with a lot, lot of the jobs that were available at the time for mechanical engineers. It was a lot of, um, here in Colorado, uh, Lockheed Martin, um, and you know, also like oil and gas development. It just didn't really align with my passions. And so I decided to take it a in a different direction. Um, and that's what drew me to working at Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment, because our agency is put in place to make sure that we have the healthiest community as possible here in Colorado um, and also the healthiest environment to enjoy. And so those were two things that just I really valued growing up in here in Colorado and um, enjoying all of our outdoor spaces. And I really wanted to contribute to making sure that that was preserved um, and available for generations to come and to be able to enjoy it. So I decided to go work uh, for Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment. That was 11 years ago today. Um, I absolutely love my job. I love working for public health and environment. It's, it's, a, great, um, it's a great passion of mine. Um, my role at CDPHE is to be a free environmental consultant for small businesses. So basically what that means is anything environmental related for a small business here in Colorado, I'm a free consultant. So whether that's helping them with compliance needs, like what kind of permits do I need? Do I need to get an air permit? Do I need a water permit? Do I need to handle my waste in any special way? Is it hazardous waste? Do I, you know, how do I access compost or recycling? all of those different aspects that feed into the environmental footprint of a business. And then also going above and beyond compliance with sustainability for those that want to, you know, integrate sustainability into their business environment, into their model um, and leverage that for, you know, higher profit margins and, and being a better asset to the community that you operate in. I can help coach businesses on what they can do and what investments they can make, what, how they can change their processes to reduce their environmental footprint. When we talk about environmental footprint, we typically think of energy usage, air pollution, waste generated, water used, water pollution generated. Those are the those are the environmental aspects that we typically focus on within the business environment. So I personally specialize in helping craft breweries and cannabis operations reduce their environmental impacts. Those are kind of my two industries of, of uh, expertise. Here in Colorado, those are two small business sectors that um, have a lot of growth trajectory here in our state. Um, back in like 2011, we, we had less than 100 breweries and now we're over um, 400. Um, cannabis industry has also thrived in that same time period. Um, cannabis being both hemp and marijuana here in Colorado, we have recreational legalization along with medical for marijuana. Um, in addition to, we legalized hemp a few years before uh, the federal uh, government did. And so we've had hemp a little bit longer here um, in Colorado. And so really, how do we how do we help these businesses, like I said, reduce their environmental impacts and be a greater asset to our state? And so really that's my role, helping you know coach breweries on how to use less water, how to use less energy. Same with cannabis operators. How can you um, continue to create high quality products for your customers 
at a lower footprint, a lower cost to not only you, but your community. Use less energy, um, generate less waste, really optimize all of your processes. Um, and that's that's how we fit into the, the CDPHE mission as well, is making sure that we have the healthiest environment for all of our citizens here in Colorado. Um, and, and in turn, um, the greatest public health. Uh, Colorado CDPHE is actually unique in that we are one agency for public health and environment because we believe those two are so integrally connected. Um, the, the public health of our, the health of our community feeds into the health of our environment and vice versa. Um, the health of our environment deeply impacts the health of our communities. And so everything we can do to kind of work um, together to, to raise all boats, you know? <laughs> The, um, you know, I think that is unique and we are one of the healthiest states here. Um, and mostly because of that, do other states not have that, that, you know, kind of joint oversight to work together? Yeah, typically it's two separate agencies. Typically it's a uh, department of public health and then there's a separate department of environmental quality. And that's, you know, that's the typical model for most states. Um, it's similar to like at the federal level, if, uh, you know, Center for Disease Control and EPA were one agency, um, environmental, EPA being Environmental Protection Agency, sorry about the acronyms. But, you know, so we we have our public health agency um, integrally connected to, to our environmental agency. And when it comes to marijuana, um, it's really been an asset and a benefit um, in so many ways. Like when you, specifically when you talk about let's say packaging um, and packaging waste streams. You know, it's our public health side of the house that sets those, those child-proof packaging standards and ensures, you know, all the labeling standards and the, you know, the safety and security that comes along um, for the consumer, along with all those packaging requirements. But then we also have the environmental side of the house that can kind of consult and, and kind of guide them and say, well, if we do, you know, that many layers of packaging, this is going to increase our waste footprint, or um, it may let make uh, recyclable packaging materials less accessible. Um, it's a it's a conversation that can be had in an open dialogue, and so I'm really proud of Colorado for for combining those two agencies, and it seems to be a really great relationship. You know, both of us, we were talking earlier, natives to Colorado, and you know, we've seen many changes over the years, and outside of Colorado. You know, I, I think we kind of take it for granted. You know, a lot of people are saying you guys are the OGs for many things, you know, craft breweries, uh, cannabis. And I was wondering how closely do the cannabis laws or regulations follow what we learned in the craft brewery, you know, from the med? You know, how do we how does that work in terms of that collaboration? Yeah, it's it's kind of an interesting question that you ask. There's not a whole lot of overlap between craft brewing and cannabis in the way of businesses being able to work together because they're two highly regulated um, products, alcohol and marijuana, um, and, and both fall under really stringent regulatory spectrums. However, both are regulated by our Department of Revenue, our State Department of Revenue. That's who regulates liquor licensing. That's who regulates marijuana, you know, business licensing as well. And so there's there's an interesting connection there. Um, but there's also some opportunities for them to work together in the name of the environment. Um, you know, one really great project that I pulled together that was to reduce the environmental impacts of both the brewing industry and the the cannabis industry was um, by way of recycling CO2. And, and we wanna recycle CO2 because car CO2 is carbon dioxide and carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. And what makes it a greenhouse gas is it is really good at heat retention. It's kind of like, you know, really good sleeping bag or those, um, you know, those really popular crazy insulated coffee mugs that make it stay hot for like three hours. Um, it has really good heat retention properties. And so CO2 when released into the atmosphere kind of soaks up the sun and the, you know, the heat and it, it holds on to it. And that's how we get the impacts of, of global warming and climate change. Um, and so here in Colorado, we really want to focus on keeping those greenhouse gases out of the atmosphere so that they don't have that heat retention capabilities. And so one way that the brewing industry and the marijuana industry can work together um, in the name of, of the environment and climate change is at craft breweries, the last stage of earing brew is the ferment fermentation process, um, or sorry, brewing beer, not the other way around, <laughs> um, uh, is the fermentation process. And that's where the yeasts are eating the sugars and actually creating the alcohol. 
a byproduct of that is also generating a lot of CO2. That mm -hmm. CO2 is typically just vented out of the fermentation tank and released into the atmosphere. Um, CO2 is also a commodity that both breweries and marijuana cultivators buy. I mean, they pay you know, anywhere from 30 to 50 cents a pound, um, depending on the market for, for CO2. Um, so it's a commodity of value. So um, at the brewery, we installed some really innovative technology um, made by Earthly Labs. And it, what that technology allowed us to do is capture that CO2 coming off of the fermentation tank, capture that gas, compress it, liquefy it, put it in a tank, and then we're able to transfer that tank from the brewery over to the marijuana cultivation to be released within the cultivation rooms to help feed the plants and aid them in, in photosynthesis. Because in an indoor cultivation environment, one of the things that we're doing to the plants is we're manipulating that life cycle down from what would be like a six to nine month life cycle in an outdoor grow environment down to maybe two to four months in an indoor grow environment. But those plants still need all the ingredients to life to be able to thrive. One of those ingredients is CO2. They use CO2 in photosynthesis um, in order to be able to, to leverage all the, that great lighting that we have in these indoor environments. We need supplemental CO2 for the plants to perform optimally to really be able to take in all that light and utilize it for photosynthesis. So they take in the carbon and they release, uh, use it as energy, and then they release it as oxygen. And so ultimately, we're taking what would be, um, you know, an emitter of CO2, a, a greenhouse gas contributor that would just be vented to the atmosphere as their regular process. We're capturing it, we're using it as a commodity, and then we're selling it to the marijuana operator just down the street and really reducing environmental impacts at both the brewery and the cannabis cultivation, bringing down cost of operations. Um, it's about a 20% price cut for the marijuana cultivator to buy the CO2 from the brewery versus a traditional supplier. Um, so it's just a really great relationship. So here in Colorado, we're, we're really looking at anything we can do in the way of the industrial footprint of both craft brewing and cannabis, and how can we bring it down? And it's great, I love being an environmental coach because anything we do to reduce our environmental footprint increases our profit margins. Really what sustainability is all about is resource optimization and efficiency. Using the least amount of natural resources or inputs to your process to get the greatest amount of high quality product out of your process. And in turn, that's going to end up, you know, increasing your profit margins. It's, it's money in your pocket to become more efficient. And so, um, yeah, it's a, it's a great, career path to have i i love working with all of my my brewing and my ca cannabis businesses oh, i mean it's a great job description you know if you'd <laughs> ask anybody they're like yeah that, that's awesome well, let's talk about you know really in terms of the programs that you're doing the work that's going on you know let's talk about the past present and really what's going to happen in the future so in the past in terms of colorado cannabis and craft brewery kind of what was it like before there were coaches or anything like that yeah so both um, have a, a, a boom history here in Colorado. Basically, you know, not many um, breweries or cannabis businesses, um, you know, 10, 20 years ago, it was kind of a niche thing. And, and you know, it gained popularity um, in both and legalization. Um, and really, Colorado has become a hub for both craft brewing and cannabis products. And so, you know, those are both thriving um small business sectors in Colorado. And I say small business because most of most craft breweries and most cannabis operators are what we define as a small business. And our definition is 100 employees or less. But um, if you think about it, I mean, most of our cannabis operators and most of our breweries fall under that definition of 100 employees or less. Hmm. They also are high resource load um, industries. They, you know, it takes a lot of energy to brew beer because you've got a lot of temperature fluctuations. You know, you're heating the brew up and you're boiling it with, um, you know, with the grains. And then you've got to you know, slowly cool that brew down. And then in fermentation, um, you know, you're also controlling, highly controlling the temperature. And then to um, deactivate the yeast, you've got to, uh, you know, do a, a glycol jacket on the fermentation tank to really cool it off very quickly. Um, so that's where you're getting the energy footprint. It's also, you know, a lot of um, a water, you know, water intensive um, mm -hmm. process as well. And then, you know, some agri agricultural impacts, the input into that process is an agricultural product, right? We've got grains um, and hops and things like that. And so, it, you know, really a footprint on our agricultural sector as well. And so similarly, moving over to the cannabis industry, um, 
again, high resource load industry because you here in Colorado, we primarily grow indoors because of our regulatory structure. It's it's very difficult to get a license to cultivate outside. Um, and with our zoning restrictions and things like that, oftentimes it gets zoned industrial. And so it's sort of forced into this indoor warehouse environment in Colorado. That's primarily how, how our cannabis is grown. And when you force uh, cultivation into an indoor warehouse environment, um, you've got a lot of a lot of supplemental light that's needed and a lot of HVAC load. Um, you're heating and cooling, you know, mostly cooling because of your lights generate a lot of heat. So not only are there um, energy loads from from the lighting, they generate a lot of heat as a byproduct of those those lights. Um, LED lights are an option that are coming up quickly. That technology is developing very quickly for indoor agriculture and specifically cannabis. Before we didn't see um, the light spectrum needed to get that dense production from the cannabis plants, we're starting to see LEDs adapt and, and get that light spectrum. Um, and they have the advantage of not adding that additional heat load because here in Colorado, we've got these lights running um, you know, 12 to 18 hours a day is pretty typical for any room um, that's, that's cultivating cannabis, depending on where it's at within the cycle. So those lights are on all the time and then they're generating heat all the time. And then you're pretty much running, uh, you know, uh, air conditioning almost 24 hours a day to combat that heat load of your lights. Even when it's on a day like today, when there's snow outside and it's cold, oftentimes these warehouses have to um, air condition their, their indoor environments because it's just such a heat load from the lights. Uh, also, being an agricultural product itself, you know, we we still, even though we don't have the impacts of growing agriculture outdoors, we've got some of the water impacts from from the the effluent um, water runoff. Um, you know, we've got the waste, same traditional uh, waste streams from agriculture. You've got a lot of plant waste at the end of the day, and what's the best way to handle that and handle it sustainability? So. It's kind of like the 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 past of, of Colorado um, cannabis in in brewing in that large growth sectors, high resource load. Um, I've been in my role at CDPHE being a free environmental coach for the last ten years, and how I typically work is I'll focus on industries. Um, I'll focus for a couple of years at a time. So 2016 and 2017 was when I really focused um, on working with the craft beer industry mm -hmm. here in Colorado, and then 2018 through today, um, I've been working with the cannabis industry and the CO2 project where we talked about capturing that CO2 from the fermentation tanks at the brewery and then transferring them to the marijuana cultivation to aid in photosynthesis um, and essentially become a sink for those greenhouse gases was done um, just this last year in 2020. That pilot ran um, January through July. It's now an ongoing business operation for both of those businesses because it was such a great success. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of, you know, the the past of how we got to today of working with, you know, breweries and cannabis businesses and, and how do we elevate them to sustainability, which brings me to the present day of, I'm really excited to share um, with both you and the audience that the National Cannabis Industry Association um, sponsored an effort where we had a group of about 30 environmental experts from all over the country. Um, a couple of folks from Canada participated as well. So we got that, that uh, perspective from them to write a really comprehensive report on what are the environmental impacts of the mm -hmm. cannabis industry. Peel back the layers of all these different um, regulatory markets, you know, Colorado versus California, California mostly grows outdoor versus mm -hmm. Canada where they've got federal legalization, you know, peel back all these layers of legalization, and really just look at the process of cannabis cultivation and processing to create all these products, the edibles, the lotions, tinctures, you name it, um, anything that ends up in the store. What are the environmental impacts of that process? Energy, air, water, waste, land impacts, you know, all those different impacts. Then what are the best management practices that we can arm the cannabis industry with to not only reduce those environmental impacts, but also increase their profit margins, like I discussed? How do we become more efficient as a cannabis industry? Um, and there's some really, really great recommendations throughout that report. And then we took it even a step further um, and talked about policy considerations. Um, we were very careful to not point out like any one policy that's a one size fits all, but more if regulators, whether it's at the state or federal level, um, if they're considering cannabis legalization, what what types of, of policies need to be in place to ensure environmental sustainability? Because what we found is 
oftentimes uniquely in the marijuana industry and in cannabis, um, regulations can be a barrier to sustainability. Mm. Um, specifically in the realm of, of waste, I think is a great example. We all kind of are familiar with some form of all marijuana waste leaving the facility has to be mixed with 50% non-marijuana waste and rendered unusable and unrecognizable. That makes sense when you look at it from the intent of safety, security, no illicit market diversion. Mm -hmm. But when you look at it through the lens of sustainability, you're actually, you're doubling your landfill footprint and you're mandating it by regulations because yeah. it's really hard for a cannabis business to come up with 50% um, organic waste stream in order to be able to compost and not to mention compost typically charge per pound of pickup. And so you're right. doubling your pickup percentage before you, you know, you even get there. And so talking about some of those maybe unintended consequences um, of policy and regulation um, and what, what can be um, changed and so proud of Colorado continues to lead the way in cannabis. Um, that was a really great activity in 2020. Our marijuana enforcement division through our Department of Revenue had a rulemaking uh, session where they focused on sustainability and talked to all their stakeholders and said, hey, what can we do to enhance sustainability within our regulatory structure? This year, we decided to focus on some low-hanging fruit of waste handling. So basically what we did is we said, you'd no longer have to mix 50-50 if you're choosing a more sustainable option for your plant waste. So mm. if it's going to compost, if it's going to anaerobic digestion, to biochar, to some other sustainable disposal method that gets an environmental benefit out of it, whether it's nutrient recovery or um, capturing air emissions like within uh, anaerobic digester that captures the methane and the CO2, which are a byproduct of the plants breaking down naturally. If you're gonna leverage some or take advantage of a sustainable um, disposal method, you no longer have to meet that 50-50 mixing requirement, you're exempt from it. And then they took it a step further and said, and by action of composting or performing one of these sustainable disposal methods, you are meeting the unusable and unrecognizable requirement. And so you don't necessarily have to mix and grind um, that plant material anymore. You're really taking out a production step in your process and you're just really sending it to compost or land, you know, away from landfill to compost or, you know, some other sustainable disposal method. Um, I wanted to, I wanted to address something here. Um, Michael Woods, uh, uh, McCausland, you've had a lot of comments on here, all great comments, uh, hard to, to reply. We'll apply to all of them, but this one here, um, where you were talking about Cannabis requires no waste, uh, not true. Just wanted to address uh, not, not only your comments, but just to say that, you know, these are really specific to Colorado. And so that's, you know, what, what uh, listeners and viewers need to understand, or if you're getting into the cannabis industry, especially in the states, every state is different. Every jurisdiction is different. Every city, municipality, they're all different. And so you're talking specifically about what we have to do. So we'll, we'll address that, Michael. But the, the issue, you know, that I saw too, when you were talking about the differences, when you're getting into this business, you know, here in, in Denver, there's a part of uh, older Denver called Rhino. It was a lot of old warehouses. There were a lot of craft breweries in there. I pulled up all these old warehouses from pre turn of the century, 1870s, 1880 buildings, really cool brick, you know, really high ceilings. Then when, when we went wrecked in 2014, then that was the movement is that all the companies kind of bought up all these warehouses and started growing in there. But an unintended consequence, like you talked about, would be there were pesticides and old oil and things. These were old factories. So up in the rafters, you know, the wood rafters, there, there were a lot of things up there that would come down onto the plants and make it unsustainable. So then we moved to more uh, outdoor grows, but then the pollution, as we were talking with temperature inversion, is not good because there's pollution and chemicals that go in outdoor grows, unlike possibly in California, as you were talking about. And now you see a lot of greenhouses that are going up, Freshland, down in Pueblo, even here in Denver, where it's their greenhouses that are built brand new, out of the ground, where you can control the temperature, the lighting, the water, everything like that. So we have had to go through these growing pains, much like many other states are going through as well. And, you know, since we were, you know, one of the very first ones here, we've learned a lot of lessons. And I think that you have seen those over the years. And, you know, I, I would encourage uh, anyone who's in a new state who's going to go uh, rec or medical to look at, at a link that, that you can post here in terms of cannabis and craft industry to get a lot of resources on there and understand more about what we went through and all those unintended consequences 
you know, of going into different buildings in a quick way to get things up and running. Yeah, it's always harder to do sustainability by retrofit versus by design. Yeah. Um, I will tell you, I've been into a lot of those old warehouses that were not designed to be indoor agricultural environments. Yeah. And not to mention, we're taking these old equipment that's legacy to the building, like an old HVAC system that was right. never meant for indoor agriculture. It was only designed for human comfort within you know, um, a production process. Now we're giving them that latent heat load of all of those lightings and, and constantly running it at max capacity. It's not the most efficient piece of equipment. <laughs> right, yeah, exactly. I mean, there were a lot of the buildings out there, they're really cool, but they were horse stables or you know, machine factories from turn of the century. You know, And we saw that over and over again, that companies would come in they would get their operations up only to find through the med they weren't compliant. So you had to have all this, all this, um, you know, change for machinery, for HVAC, for, you know, the, the odor that was out, you know, carbon filters, like all the stuff that you don't really think about. It is a huge, huge impact on sustainability if you don't build new. So, yeah. The, I kind of like to sum it up as, you know, the differences in environmental impacts between having an indoor grow environment and an outdoor grow environment all similar impacts except for the the highest load shift so in an in indoor environment your highest environmental impacts is going to be your energy usage and your you know what's coming out of the facility whether it be waste or you know the water effluent if you go to an outdoor cultivation facility you don't have those energy impacts the major load to the environment shifts to the land mm -hmm. how do you manage your land how do you um how do you maintain healthy soils what kind of pesticides and fertilizers are you putting on that land that's causing runoff um, or potentially erosion if you don't have good root structure so um, in an outdoor environment it really shifts the environmental impacts to the land and the watershed versus in an indoor environment we're really talking about the energy grid and the municipal water system Oh, that's, that's great information. Wealth of information. You've got great experience. And I encourage any of you uh, to reach out to Caitlin, ask her questions. Can you tell us the website? I know it's long and we'll post it down below, but if you could tell the listeners out there what it is. Yes. So um, the, the our website is great. Um, it is a long URL, so uh, we will post it, but the URL is cdphe.colorado.gov backslash prevention dash and wellness slash marijuana slash greening dash the dash cannabis dash industry. I'm cracking <laughs> up because it is the longest URL in the world, but the more helpful piece of information that I can give you um, to get to our resources and get to our website. If you type in CDPHE brewing, CDPHE cannabis into Google, you'll land at our web page. Um, if you Google my name, Caitlin Urso, you will land on all of these same resources as well. So um, I always kind of tell people search engine is might be the, the, the shortest path um, to, to get to our resources, but we will have that NCIA uh, report. Um, we'll make sure we get you guys that link as well and make sure you get links to both our craft brewing and our cannabis resources. So thank you so much for having me today. Um, yeah. Yeah. Pleasure interacting I'm happy to have you here and, and your email what's the best way to get a hold of you oh yes my email is caitlin.urso at state.co.us i'll spell my first name in my last name it's k-a-i-t-l-i-n dot u-r-s-o at state .co .us. Um, <laughs> I'll also give you guys my cell phone number. Um, yeah. You're welcome to call at any time. It is 720-879-8403. It's 720-879-8403. That is my work cell. So feel free to call at any time. I only respond during business hours, but you're welcome to leave me messages anytime. <laughs> That's awesome. I've got question. I've got time for one more question here uh, from Rich. Any insights into converting machines to wind power through, through what you guys are doing? 
Um, absolutely. There's, there's always um, room for innovation. Um, we're seeing a lot more innovation in wind turbines and making more efficient wind turbines and making them a smaller footprint. And so we are starting to see, um, there's actually one cultivation that I know of in Colorado that has installed some of these, you know, really new innovative wind turbines. They almost look like sculptures. They look like almost little dancing sculptures. Hmm. Um, they, they definitely don't have the traditional windmill um, look to them. And they're more straight and rigid and they have these little pieces that rotate around them. Um, but anyways, wind technology is getting a lot more efficient. And one thing that you need to consider when you're considering wind turbines um, or, you know, converting wind energy to power your machinery is really comes down to location and doing a wind study. Are you in a traditionally windy area or are you in a mountain, you know, in a mountain valley right up against the edge where you really don't really get that much wind? Um, and so that's that's one assessment that needs to be made. Um, I used to caution against, you know, environmental assessments for for wind energy as well, making sure that you're not in the path of, you know, migratory birds. Um, but again, with wind technology, uh, you know, coming along so far these days, you're not really seeing, especially at the individual business level, you're not seeing those big wind turbines that have the traditional, um, you know, fans on them. You're really seeing these more individual units that are, they're kind of like sculptures. They're maybe about as tall as a person and about as, you know, as about as a wide. Um, and they've got different sections on them that rotate with the wind. And it's a lot more efficient way to capture that wind and, and transfer it to energy. So we are seeing some really exciting innovation um, in small enough scale that it makes sense for an individual, you know, cannabis cultivation facility to adopt some wind technology. Um, you know, we're also seeing some innovation, you know, continue to make solar. It becomes more and more financially feasible for businesses. We're starting to see those return on investment timeframes come down from like, you know, 10 years to down five, two years. It, it is possible. That's great. Awesome. Thank you. Well, we've got a lot of questions here uh, that came through and we'll answer those uh, right after this online. So if you're listening to this, make sure you go back on to watch this video. You'll see a lot of great questions and we'll post as many resources as we can in there. So thanks again and, and have a great day, Kaylin. Thank you.